Uh, the title of this talk is It's Time to Embrace Erlang. And so I'm Todd, and I'm an engineer at Weed Maps, and also on the Hex core team, and online at Super Simple. All right, so um, when I originally got involved with Elixir, like this is the sentiment that I heard. So Elixir is the solution to Erlang syntax. So like there's this great ecosystem called Erlang, but the syntax is so bad that we had to invent a new language uh, so people could use it. And, um, yeah, sorry. Uh, so I think one problem with this is like, it, it basically assumes that Erlang is, is bad. And it also, um, as a community, then what we're attracting is Erlang people that are unhappy, which is like a very small group already. Um, and we're alienating all the people that know Erlang and, um, don't, you know, don't think it's necessarily bad. So, like, one of the, the reasons people give for not liking Erlang is the documentation. So, like, this is your Erlang documentation, and granted, it's probably not as, like, easy to read as Elixir documentation, but that's a really high standard. Um, like, for example, this is the Ruby documentation, and, like, I would argue, is this really that much worse than that? Um, and, you know, honestly, I don't think so. So like one area um, I started to look at in, in the Erlang world was HTTP requests. So like this probably looks familiar to most of us. You are making an HTTP request, you're using the, the HTTP poison library, and um, you know, this is what the function signature looks like. Um, but this is what it looks like if you were just gonna use Erlang. So you know, instead of poison, you're hitting hackney. So I took a little look at what HTT poison does, and inside the poison library, it's doing this function, this do request. So basically all it's doing is delegating to a hackney, um, hackney uh, method or function. So, and uh, what about crypto? So crypto is like an example of one uh, piece of functionality that's always existed in Erlang that hasn't been ported over to Elixir. So if you're gonna do anything um, anything that's involved with crypto in I Elixir, you're going to have to use Erlang anyway. So like this is an example of really the only way you can do uh, this crypto in, in Erlang. So instead of fighting against the Erlang community, maybe we should just embrace all of our Erlang roots. Um, so, you know, first of all, it's unavoidable. If you're doing things like crypto, you're, you're gonna have to learn the Erlang APIs. Um, a lot of what is involved with what we do isn't related to Erlang uh, code itself, but is related to the VM. And that's something that we all share as a community. And like nobody besides maybe Jose has more than five years of Elixir experience. Whereas like there's this whole community, lots of people that have way more than five years of Beam experience out there. So rather than to alienate them, let's embrace um, the Erlangers of the world. So thank you and special thanks to a guy that help get me started on my Erlang journey, a guy named Brian Paxton. Find him online at Starbelly. Thanks. Hi, I'm Chris. Uh, you can find me in various places. I uh, work at Peak. Um, you can find me on GitHub, on LinkedIn, and I hang out in the Elixir Slack sometimes. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what Peak uh, contributes back to the open source community. We, uh, we've fully embraced Elixir at Peak, and we've open sourced several libraries now. Uh, so check out our um, GitHub organization here where we have several cool things to look at. I can't go over much in just five minutes, so I've chosen to just take a quick look at one of these little small libraries that we needed um, called ectodiff. Uh, so, right. Uh, so uh, one of the things that we needed was kind of to go back to like the way that in uh, Ruby, uh, forgive me if this is blasphemy, 
But uh, in Ruby, you could do like after save hooks on models, and in that, you know, after save, you could see exactly everything that changed. And yes, Ecto has change sets, and uh, the change sets kind of can kind of give you a, 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 an idea of what you're about to apply to, uh, to a schema, um, but it doesn't tell you the full picture of it um, after it makes the round trip to the database and stuff. Like for example, uh, database generated IDs, uh, data database generated default fields, and things like that. If you want to just kind of see like, all right, I've got this uh, ecto struct that I loaded from a database, um, I'm gonna perform some changes on it, I'm gonna insert that, and I wanna see after that, I wanna get a data structure just describing everything that changed. Um, and it's one thing that we needed. It's useful in a lot of different scenarios, like, for example, like audit logs and, uh, you know, various things like that. So here I'm going to do a really quick demo uh, of a more complex scenario, uh, kind of mimicking what we actually ended up using it for at peak uh, for order management. Um, one of the, the, the important thing that Ectodiff does is it, uh, it allows uh, working with uh, nested associations, right? So here I am, I'm gonna place an order um, uh, for two bookings with um, some tickets, um, and uh, it uh, inserts that into the database. Then I can get a diff um, of, of, of nil to the new order, and the data structure tells me exactly what happened, right? It inserted all of this stuff, it gives me these keys, like effect added. Um, it shows me the nested changes and stuff like that. But it really helps whenever you're doing a complex modification to a deeply nested, uh, you know, structure. Uh, again, uh, I, I didn't mention that this is all using like Ecto's magical cast associ with like multiple levels of associations. Um, so I wanted to just show what it would look like if you. In this example, what I'm doing is I'm keeping one of the bookings in my order, I'm deleting one of the bookings, I'm adding a third booking, and in one of the bookings, I'm changing the quantity of the tickets and adding a new ticket type. I know there's like a lot of information there, so it's kind of hard to see, um, but we do that. And then we just wanted to, after having done that operation, we wanna see what, the, what, what actually changed. And so this data structure here shows me uh, the changes to the order, the order was changed. The changes include the list of bookings. You can see that one of my bookings here was changed, one of my bookings was deleted, and one of, my, one of the bookings was added. And, and, of course, the nested stuff down there. So that's that. Also, we are obviously hiring. Uh, please come talk to us if you haven't already at table 13 in the other room. We've got uh, a raffle going for uh, a really cool keyboard, and just come chat with us about how you use Elixir and how we use Elixir. Thanks. I'm started. Let's talk about nerves at 400, and, uh, it's supposed to be 434 megahertz, but oh well, we'll deal with it. So uh, I, tend to, I tend to just over-engineer problems. We recently had this old 1980s ceiling fan that broke down, and we needed to get a new one. And because it's 2019, I thought it'd be fun to have one with a remote. So we ended up with a fan like this, and it was because what's better than being able to lazily control the smallest item, one of the smallest items in your house? It feels great. Oh, it's behind. Oh, well. But if you actually look really closely at these, you'll discover that they are not happy beings and they do not want to coexist with you. In fact, they're quite mischievous. The remote's always lost. Somebody puts it somewhere. And this is extremely problematic because the state is controlled at the fan. So flipping the light on and off, taking power on and off, makes no change to whatever the last state of the fan was, which means you always figure out the remote's lost at midnight when it's dark. Uh, it's no bueno. So then I got to thinking, like I always do, there's got to be a way I, get, I can spend way too much time on solving this problem that really isn't an issue. And the answer is radio. So it turns out that these devices actually, in a lot of times in your house, communicate with the radio. So in my case, the fan did. And that works great. 
because when you have radio like this, you do what's called a replay attack. Now this sounds pretty bad, it's, you know, the word attack, but uh, what it basically means is that you can listen in on a radio frequency, copy it, and then transmit it and replay it out later. Now, I don't recommend going out and scanning your neighbors and stuff and copying signals, but for my ceiling fan, totally fine. I can figure it out. Um, so you can put, there's, there's one extra piece of hardware for this, and that's these, uh, I mean, there's lots of different hardware, but I went with this SDR, this RTL SDR software defined radio dongle, and you can essentially listen in and record that signal to a file. But the cool thing is that you can actually use a Raspberry Pi running NERS on a single GPIO pin to then replay that file back. Oh, I missed, I thought I had something else. So uh, that's what we're gonna use NERS for. And I got a little demo. And if you can see, I just have one jumper wire cable on here. It's about the length I need for 430 megahertz. Um, so let's, let's try this. Oh, I'm still connected. Okay, so radio dot lights on two. So there's a few lights at other tables, and I've got this light up here, and I'm gonna hit this to transmit a previously recorded signal and see if they turn on. Ta-da! Live demos are scary. So let's, uh, let's turn them off now. Wrong, 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 wrong. Ta-da. Um, so that's, I mean, that's basically it. There's a lot more going into this. It's pretty cool. I actually wrote this all up in more detail if you wanna try to go through, through it, learn some basics and put it on embeddedelixir.com. We just published it like an hour ago. And I made a library specifically to handle this binary to be able to use the, uh, the GPIO pin to, to transmit on the wire at uh, JJ Carson slash Replex. That's also published to Hex. It's very niche, but you know, if you have lots of devices, I mean, ceiling fan is one case, but light bulbs use it. A lot of uh, plugs use it. I mean, they're, they're everywhere, so it could be pretty cool, pretty fun. And oh, this is old. That's it. Here's some contact info. All right, so, whoa. Is it possible to have a gen server without the server? Hi, my name is Daniel Azuma. Uh, I work at this place. And a few weeks ago, I had this really terrible idea. Um, so I was thinking about how gen servers work. Uh, you know, internally, a gen server is just a function, right? It's, uh, it runs in a process, it runs repeatedly uh, in response to messages uh, that get sent to the process. And each time, the, the function returns some state, which then gets passed uh, into the next iteration of the function. So, you know, gen servers, basically that's how it works. There's a few other additional features. But this, in, this architecture looks kind of similar to another common architecture. Uh, that some people use. Uh, and that's serverless in the cloud, right? Like functions as a service. So in a serverless app, you might have uh, a function that runs uh, in response you know, in the cloud in response to events, uh, messages that get sent on a message queue like Kafka or you know, additional message que uh, queuing systems. And any state uh, gets persisted outside the function in a database someplace. So you, know, you, you might need to put in a little additional logic to make sure things uh, operate serially, uh, but otherwise, if you kind of squint, uh, these architectures are just basically the same architecture. And so conceivably, you could implement one on top of the other. So imagine writing something like this, something that kind of looks like a gen server. Uh, you define the same kinds of callbacks in it, handle cast, and so forth. Uh, but what if these callbacks run, instead of running in a gen server process, they run you know, in the cloud, in, in a serverless environment, right? Yeah, it's a terrible idea, right? 
is a terrible idea. It is kind of intriguing, though. Uh, so just for kicks, I tried implementing it. Uh, what I did was I spun up uh, kind of serverless functions in Cloud Run, uh, which is uh, it's a, it's a product as part of Google Cloud. Uh, I used Google PubSub uh, for the queue. Uh, I tried using Google Firestore to, pers to uh, persist the state. Uh, kind of dis doesn't uh, work as well. It's, it's not designed for this kind of uh, application. So uh, it turns out something like Redis might work better. Didn't have time to change my implementation, so uh, I have it kind of working sort of on Firestore. Uh, so let me show you a quick demo uh, of this, if I have time, uh, actually. First off, uh, here's the code uh, that I'm going to be running in this kind of gen serverless process. It's a simple accumulator. You cast numbers at it, and it, it keeps a running total. Uh, I also rigged up a quick and dirty cloud uh, uh, logger so as you can see uh, the, the callbacks being run in the cloud because they're running in the cloud, and you, you can't actually uh, see them in the console. So let me switch over really quick. Uh, so let's see, uh, we'll just do this here. Uh, so up here, uh, I'm going to stream my logs. Uh, and hopefully the Wi-Fi starts up. So, uh, so we'll, we'll start by starting uh, a gen serverless uh, in the cloud. And if uh, the Wi-Fi is working, we should see, uh, we should see, there it is. Uh, so the init function uh, got called in the, in the serverless environment. Uh, now we can, we can cast some numbers uh, at it, uh, and we should see uh, the, the, uh, those, those functions getting called. Uh, Wi-Fi is a little bit slow right now, and is it going to happen? It's a cast. Well, yeah, but uh, it's uh, uh, it should be uh, it should be generating a log, which I'm I'm listening to at this sort of process, and it's not working. Great. Live demos in the lightning talk are always fun. Okay, but anyway. Um, uh, it, was you have to? You know, it was working. Um, <laughs> so let's uh, let me go back out of here. Um, how do I get out of this now? Here we go. Let's just uh, let's just get this out of here. Oh, I'm okay. Anyway. Uh, so it, it's so it's working there. It's it's, it's it is a terrible idea, uh, but uh, you know there there are a few things that uh, you know I still have to figure out. But it does show that uh, there are some uh, interesting affinities between these two uh, these two things, Beam and serverless, that generally don't work that well together. So if you have some uh, ideas, uh, I've. Uh, you know, some thoughts on this. I'd love to talk to you. Come, uh, uh, come find me. Um, hi, my name is Tyler Clemens, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Phoenix Live View in healthcare. Um, I work for a company called DJO. Um, we have a development team there of about uh, 12 developers. Um, we pretty much all come from Ruby, um, doing uh, Ruby and Rails, and uh, right now we have. Uh, a uh, large Rails app and two Phoenix apps in production now. Um, LiveView was uh, announced last year at ElixirConf. Chris McCord announced that. Um, I remember it being announced and sitting there and looking at to my coworkers and just like jaws drop, like, oh, this is what we've been waiting for, right? Like, no more JavaScript. Um, and then I remember like constantly refreshing Chris's uh, uh, Twitter and looking at Elixir Slack, like, when is it coming out? When is it coming out? Um, and I remember he tweeted on, in March, Chris did, about it going live. And uh, we shipped it to production in May. Um, it, was, it was fast. It was super easy to implement. Um, some of the things like, we learned from it right away was like, it's, it was easy to build on top of. And when requirements changed, it was really easy to go, uh, go in there and make those changes in live view and, and kind of change with the business. Um, and testing was amazing, uh, being able to use EX unit or uh, you know, to do testing versus JavaScript. Um, one of the products we shifted in is a product called AuraScore. Um, it's kind of a mouthful, but it's Outpatient Arthroplasty Risk Assessment Score. <laughs> um, and there's a little bit about it there, but it's basically kind of a, a questionnaire and assessment trying to figure out if patients are 
good candidates for outpatient surgery, um, specifically around uh, total knee or total hip replacements. Um, in true lightning talk fashion, I'm going to give a live demo. All right. All right, so this is the page in Aura that uh, we're using LiveView. Um, so on the left here, we have um, a bunch of patients and um, they're listed with a, a typical um, Phoenix request. Um, when you click it, and then it, it, LiveView gets connected to it, when you click this review button, um, this selects a patient, uh, it comes back with LiveView, uh, and we're using change sets on the back end to take that patient, uh, run it through a change set, and then show it like you would with a typical controller request, but all through LiveView, uh, which is super nice. It kind of gives that like single page app feel. Um, this specific page in the application is, is kind of like a, um, a dashboard for our users. Like these are the patients you need to go review um, to come look at them. And what we're doing is, is taking that data and um, kind of like a typical form, we're submitting it back. Uh, we get the nice air change set functionality uh, with, uh, with Ecto, which is super nice. Um, and from there, we were able to, this was kind of like an MVP, the next thing the business came back with and was like, oh, we'd really like to filter uh, these patients. Uh, by the way, for the record, this is all non-PHI data, fake generated data. Um, but uh, so yeah, so they wanted to do filters. So we're like, okay, how do we do that with Live View? I think we can just update the patient data. Um, so we changed the back end. That gets sent as a Live View request. Um, it updates the query for the patients. We have to the patient list and boom, LiveView takes care of like all the rest, um, which was super nice and refreshing from, uh, you know, coming from writing a bunch of JavaScript or trying to do that as a single page app feel. Um, yeah, so, okay, let's go back. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. I want to thank DGO for, uh, for letting us come out here. They pay for us to come to a conference a year. Super awesome place to work for. Um, being in healthcare, it's usually a lot of red tape and slow, but they really allow us to innovate and use Elixir and ship it and start using things like LiveView. Um, the Elixir community, awesome. Everybody in Slack, everybody in the community is super helpful. Um, you know, being able to talk to Chris and Jose right there, you know, when, they're, when they have free time is awesome. You can find me on GitHub at Tyler, T-I-E-L-U-R. And I'm also in Elixir Slack, same name. Thanks. Um, so I'm Dennis Beatty. Um, I'm here from Podium uh, out in Utah. Uh, they are one of the premier sponsors here. And um, yeah, they, they paid for my whole trip. And so uh, obligatory slide for them. Um, so I, I've been trying to make a lot of YouTube videos about Elixir, trying to help like pull in more of the um, crowd from like JavaScript and stuff who um, are, are usually looking for kind of more flashier demos, I think. And so one that I made a while back was um, talking about IO ANSI for making um, CLIs. And so what that allows you to do is use ANSI escape codes really easily to change kind of the colors of your output, to move the cursor around and things like that. Um, and one of the things that I didn't know about very well when I uh, created that video was um, a thing called IO lists. And so when I did that, um, I started out by just kind of uh, replicating a Docker Compose output. And so outputting kind of three different uh, fake little apps within Docker, and then um, creating this, this green text. So the IO.ANSI library um, uses I, um, ANSI escape codes to actually change the colors. And so by outputting that io.ansi.green um, before your done text, it makes the done text green. And then putting the reset afterwards says go back to your default. And so by concatenating those three and then outputting it, you, you're basically outputting green text that says done. Um, and many of you have probably seen that within Elixir when your errors pop up um, as red or um, if you're running your tests and all the little dots show up as green. Um, that's all using ANSI escape codes to do that. Um, and so then you can do even more advanced stuff. So you'll see here where we're actually putting the, the done at the end of the lines. Um, you'll see within that pipeline at the bottom, 
um, we're moving the cursor up um, by um, the, the line number that it needs to, to get to. And then we're using the special kernel string append syntax to append um, the code to, to move the cursor to the right um, to get to the end of the line. And then we're using the kernel append again to append that done text that we had just created. Um, and then we're appending a carriage return. And then we're appending the cursor down to get it back to the original place. Um, and then we're writing that all out to, um, to the terminal so that it will show up. And so one thing that, that this does, um, oh yeah, and then in our, in our original function, what I did is I just um, created a range from one to three and then shuffle it up and call that line done function for each of those so that it'll just randomly order what, um, when they display. And so um, this kind of creates this um, longer um, bit of code, but I'm going to go ahead and kind of demo that for you. So if we go into our terminal, and I'll just paste that into an Elixir file. Then um, we see that it creates the text, and then it appends done to those in random order. Um, however, let's go a little bit into the, um, the way that this is done. So right now, when we create the done text, we're starting out by allocating a string um, for io.ansi.green. Then we allocate another string for done, and then we're allocating another string for io.ansi.reset. Then our concat operator is concatenating the first two together and allocating another string for that, and then we're allocating a final string. Oh, am I at the end? Oh, okay. Um, so what we can do to, to make this even better um, is to use IO lists. And so what these do is they stream the bytes. So instead of concatenating your string together, you just stream all the bytes into IO. So working with our line done, we can basically just convert it so that instead of allocating all these different strings, all we do is we create a list of all the strings together and then write that out. And we can do the same thing with our done text. Um, just putting those pieces into a string instead of concatenating them. Um, and so then we don't have to allocate the concatenated versions. And you'll notice that this will make it so that our final IO list is actually a list nested within another list, but that's totally fine because we just um, output to IO from uh, the beginning to the end. Um, and so we can have the same code that is simpler to read because our strings are just in a list rather than having to concatenate over and over. Um, and it's a little bit more performance as well. So that's kind of all I had. Um, I'd love to have you reach out to me on Twitter if you have any questions. Um, otherwise, there's this great article by Big Nerd Ranch um, where they talk about these and explain them really well. Thanks. Hello, everyone. My name is Daniel Spofford. I'm the full stack practice lead at Very. We're a consultancy with strong cross-functional skills. That means design and UX, cloud services, software, firmware, and hardware, both custom and off the shelf, et cetera. But today, I will be heralding Herald because I really just want to scan a thing. So let's get started. Some time ago, Vary was approached and tasked with exploring a particular solution to a supply chain logistics problem. If you want to count buzzwords, now is probably a good place to start. The high level view is, what we, is that we needed to put BLE tags on products that a nearby gateway device would scan for and report on. We work in tight iterations and don't like blockers or bugs. NERVS allows us to quickly write robust firmware once that can run on a variety of hardware targets, both off the shelf and custom. In fact, at the end of this project, I was supporting four targets on my own in production. Combine that with over the air firmware updates with, via NERVS Hub, and you're really cooking. To reiterate, NERVS is feature-rich feature and makes the development cycle a brief. Wait a minute. What does that system feature list say? Zoom? Enhance? Bluetooth not supported? Yikes. That's pretty critical to our use case. So what do I do? What is the path forward here? Turns out it's a little bit of disappointment and pain. The often suggested path is to leverage BlueZ, a common means for managing and interacting with Bluetooth in the Linux space. There are a couple of issues with that, though. Shelling out is selling out. 
Not really, but sometimes your constraints force you to, and it feels a little disappointing. Um, second, what the heck's a Linux? Honestly, you're never going to dodge this completely with nerves, and in fact, any non-trivial project is going to push you towards Linux kernel Google searches and mailing threads from the 80s. But one of the best things about nerves is that it draws a box around that for you, and you can stay in higher level code more. It would be really nice if we had first-class control over Bluetooth and Elixir, buying us familiar data structures and design patterns which translate into productivity. Third, the subtitle of this talk is just let me scan a thing. That's usually the case. You want to leverage a fraction of the percent of Bluetooth, and you're met with a barrier to entry that is daunting at best, not to mention storage and bandwidth constraints on embedded devices. Finally, not everyone has a green thumb and time to add Buildrit to their garden, unless you're using FarmBot, of course, then it's a breeze. So where are we headed? What's, what's the alternative here? Let's cut to the chase. Bluetooth has the concept of HCI, the host controller interface. Herald is a Bluetooth host library. It communicates with Bluetooth controllers, typically integrated circuits on boards. Importantly, it allows you to not include BlueZ and friends at all, to stay within Elixir, to have your cake and eat it too. The idea is that you can simply add Herald like any other dependency, provide minimal configuration, like indicating which controller you're working with, since some of them require different stand-up procedures, start your app, scan for BLE devices, and move on. Supply chain logistics solved. But wait, there's more. Herald is in this classic dev space of trusted and used in production while simultaneously under active pre-1.0 development. We've been working to morph Herald from an internal specific solution to a friendly, extensible open source project. And we're close, but we're not there yet. The spec, meaning the binary structure of hundreds of commands and events, how they're serialized and deserialized, will be defined as a terse and legible Elixir data structure that will almost exactly mirror what you would see in the Bluetooth spec documentation. And this buys us a lot. The spec is parsed once at, comp at compile time and generates serializers and deserializers that convert from binary to map in single function calls. It also generates stream data generators, facilitating incredibly powerful system property testing, as well as a means to simply explore what the guts of Bluetooth looks and feels like. In the context of Herald, <clears throat> functionality that spans time and requires coordinating multiple commands and events is referred to as high-level functionality. Today, the only high-level functionality supported is BLE scans. However, low-level functionality, meaning the convenient ability to send any commands you want um, and process any event you receive, is also possible today. Wrapping up here, I want to outline what our roadmap looks like generally. Defining the spec as data and generating the world is almost done. After that, we want to level up the documentation so that using and contributing to Herald is easy. You can expect that soon. The last three points are longer-term roadmap items that we'll, get, that we'll get to much faster if we nail those first two points. I'm Daniel Spofford. Reach out if you want to chat about this, and thank you for your time. So hi, my name is uh, John Palgett, and the name of this talk is You Need a Supervisor. A uh, bit of background, I work at a company called uh, Grio. We're a software agency consultancy uh, app studio in uh, San Francisco. And we generally work with uh, startups that don't have development teams or have a very small development team. Um, and so the client I've been working with for the past year is a company called Sutro. And they're building a IoT device that goes inside your pool and it measures your pool chemistry. So it'll say like, oh, your pH is too low or your pH is too high, alkalinity is a little bit off, and then give you recommendations about what chemicals to put into your pool. Um, so a bit of background on the architecture of this project. The uh, API that we built in Elixir is sort of on the right here. Um, and all those little, little water bottle looking things, the suture devices, they connect to Amazon uh, IoT Core over a protocol called MQTT. And they send messages which get queued up into an SQS queue. And then we sort of pull these messages off of the queue um, you know, as soon as we can whenever the API is up, or when the, while the API is up. So if we go down, it's not a problem. You know, we can turn the API back on, fix the problem, and it'll continue processing messages from the queue like nothing happened. Um, but so one day, before we're uh, to back it up, they're still, they still haven't launched this product yet, so we're kind of in super beta. Um, and so one day the client was kind of tooling around sending uh, MQTT messages, and they said, hey, the site's down. It stopped uh, updating the readings in my app. What's going on? And we're like, well, that, that doesn't happen. You know, this is uh, Elixir sailing. This is beam. It doesn't crash. It doesn't go down. And uh, so we went to the logs, and we're like, hey, what's going on? Um, and I couldn't find the logs, but they looked a little bit something like this. They're like, starting the application, starting the event consumer, shutting down the application. And we're like, what? Like, what do you mean, what? Um, 
So we're logging this little, little port, and we went and added some logs, redeployed, and we're like, hey, we're going to solve this, guys. Trust us. Um, and so back to this architecture, what we found out happened is the client, while they were pretty technical, they didn't quite understand what JSON was. And so they're putting uh, poorly formatted messages into the queue. And enough of those messages got uh, put into the queue that when the app started up, it would pull a malformed message off and crash, and then restart, and pull another malformed message off and crash and restart, and pull another malformed message off, crash and restart. Um, and there's this thing about supervisors and processes that I didn't realize um, until now. Uh, there's a max restart and max seconds properties when you declare your you know, children processes. So if your process crashes um, you know, n number of times within m number of seconds of starting up, the Erlang beam says, hey, this is not something that could maybe fail. This is something that's going to fail. I'm going to terminate the supervisor of this process. Um, and so I went and looked at our uh, supervisor code, like our application code, and it looked a little something like this, uh, where we're just sort of spinning up the event consumers and producers and directly sticking them right under our application. So we'd start up, we'd grab these malformed messages, we'd crash, we'd do it again, we'd crash, we'd do it again, we'd crash, and then Erlang's like, whoa, let's kill the parent to that process, which was our entire application tree. Uh, so that's not good. So uh, lessons learned. Like, this wasn't something, you know, we were all relatively new to the Elixir ecosystem. We'd done some hobby projects and some, you know, some other projects, but this is the first, like, production-ready system. Um, so what are the takeaways? Like, what can we learn? What can we do better next time? How can we prevent something like this from happening again? Um, use a supervisor. That's always good. You know, have somebody monitoring your process that's meant to monitor your process. So if it crashes and you run into this situation, you know, that process goes down, not your entire application. Um, better logging and better monitoring. This is, you know, a must-have, right? Like, at first it just said, hey, shutting down the app, and we didn't even log, like, what messages were coming through or things like that. So that was a big oversight on our part. Um, and then, additionally, we decided that this portion of our code was so, like, mission critical that we didn't want that process to just ever go down. So now we put, wrapped it in a try rescue, and if malformed messages come through or, like, it, sometimes the device sends us a string instead of a float when it's measuring temperature or something, uh, we handle that message and we log it and we say, hey, like, something went wrong. Please don't crash. Like, we need this to continue processing messages. So, uh, and that's it. Thank you. I'm Melissa Caps and I make apps. Uh, so cars.com spoke earlier today on how they, with the help of Dockyard, have started to convert their entire dev team over to Elixir in under three months and to rebuild their entire site within the year. And we can't all be as amazing as cars.com, but even without their resources, I can tell you that you can build an amazing Elixir dev team from scratch with a limited time and a small team. So not only is this um, it, it, something that everybody here has probably struggled with, this is a um, worldwide problem. The tech skill gap is widening, and there's also a rapidly growing socioeconomic divide. And I think the problem is twofold. One, there are more tech jobs than there are people who can do them. There's 3.7 million tech jobs in 2018 and only 1.5 million software developers to fill them. Two, um, current hiring methods and pipelines fail to market to large swaths of people that would make great additions to your development team. So I'd like everybody to raise their hands real quick. Come on, we've been sitting all day. All right, so everybody has their hands up and please drop your hand if you have a bachelor's or associate's degree. So if you list that that is a requirement, you've just eliminated 75% of the eligible workforce. Everybody raise their hands again. Now raise your, or lower your hand if you are male. You just eliminated approximately 55% of the U.S. workforce. Uh, in 2017, HubSpot um, said that 94% of developers in the U.S. were male. I think that number's a little high, but Google reported 80%. And interestingly enough, 63% of those men were white. Um, only 31% of the US population is a white male. And don't get me wrong, I love you guys. I even married a white dude. Um, but we are definitely missing out on an opportunity to grow our workforce. So while this quick demo shows you that, and these stats may be not 100% you know, accurate, what I wanted to show you is that there's 2.2 million open tech jobs and a limited supply of white dudes. So 
All kidding aside, um, diversifying your dev team actually has a direct impact on your bottom line. So 2015 Kinsey report found that the top 75% of most diverse companies had roughly 35% higher profit margins. That's something we could all get behind. So how do you go about um, um, uh, to diversifying and growing your dev team at the same time? Um, my proposal is that you host your own training program. So two years ago, I found myself laid off for the second time from the accounting field in less than seven months. And I have no college degree. I have 14 years of experience, but I faced a dilemma. I was go back to school and get my CPA license, which filled me with dread, or switch careers entirely. Um, by this time, I was really enjoying cloud software more than I was enjoying the work, and a friend convinced me to try a coding boot camp. Six months and $10,000 later, I felt I had wasted my time and my money just to learn how to Google and read Stack Overflow messages. I was honestly still in doubt if I wanted to code at all. And not everyone who wants to code can afford a 10K training program. So luckily last year, I happened across another boot camp called Empower in a smaller city about two hours away. These two crazy guys at a small software company called SiteSource were offering a full stack boot camp 40 hours a week for eight weeks. And it was free. It was 100% free. Plus, SiteSource was looking to hire directly out of the trainees. It was a two-way interview, participants getting to know the company and the company screening the participants. Did we learn every language that we covered? No, come on. <laughs> it takes a lot of time to learn, truly learn coding. But one of the things that my classmates said best was that we learned how to learn to code. So I was lucky. I got a job along with five other awesome people, and we've been coding now for over a year. Surveys find that it takes roughly 40K in real and intangible costs and three to four months on, to onboard a new employee. And so how did a small dev team of two guys manage this and meet client deadlines with six brand new baby developers? They immediately put us to work. We wrote and deployed a new JavaScript to clean up SQL backups on AWS in our first week. My second week, I pitched to a potential new client and a prototype that I wrote in React in one week. We got that contract and I got my full stack Elixir project. In two months, I was able to knock out a few features on my own. In another two months, I was working autonomously. Granted, I had a lot of help from leaders and my teammates, but I delivered our first, my first project, a fixed asset inventory tracking app in about five months. Today, uh, or let me let you know just a few other keynotes about um, Empower. We had 500 applicants, the majority of them being female. After interviews, 46 were admitted and 44 completed the program. We ended up hiring full, seven full-time employees, three full-time contractors. Only three of us had college degrees. We were 30% female and 30% minorities. We've already done seven major deployments with more in progress. And what they gained in taking a risk on all of us was that we have the experience and empathy from a Cicerone, a daycare worker, a physicist, a music teacher, an accountant. We write in a variety of languages and we're very excited to offer this program again in 2020. Thank you. Hello, my name is Matt Ludwigs and I work for a company called SmartRent. We use, uh, we, where we build a custom um, IoT home automation platform for property managers and their tenants. And at SmartRent, I get to do NERVs um, and it's really fun and we have custom hardware. And one of the things that we are trying to solve for is communicating to smart home devices such as thermostats, locks, et cetera. So when you, when you kind of dive into that field, um, kind of like Bluetooth, there's, it's crazy. And so we have to go and handle our own library to do this. And so we are planning on open sourcing this library and its name is Grizzly. So about Grizzly, it uses Z-Wave under the hood, which is a home automation, uh, low frequency radio protocol for com communicating and controlling these devices. What Grizzly does, it handles a lot of complexity of Z-Wave. Z-Wave is a very large specification with a lot of ins and outs and a lot of security things involved with it. So it automatically will handle some of those security things out of the box. It has an extensible command API. So if you send commands to these devices and if you're using Grizzly and we don't support that command, we expose Elixir behavior. Um, so you can build your command, drop it into our, our library, and it'll just take it and run with it. 
It has error isolation, so we stole a page out of Phoenix's book where anytime, say you have a, a network of many devices, if you send a command over here and it fails, nobody else is gonna have any issues and everything will keep rolling. And it works with nerves, and so you can build your own smart home. So if you're kind of a hobbyist hacker and want to start building, all this complexity, all the hard stuff is hopefully solved by Grizzly, and you can uh, build your own smart home. So, demo time. Can everyone see that? Okay, cool. So we have this smart lock here. Um, the first, oop, grizzly. So we're gonna list the nodes out here that are on our network, and there are none, so let's add this. That's a nice audio. Wireless module setting mode. Okay. Join the wireless network. So we're just putting that kind of there, and then, so add node. So I'm gonna add the node. So right now the controller, so I have this Raspberry Pi 3 with the USB controller, is emitting, hey, join the network, and we're gonna say, okay. Completed. So I joined the network. Um, this runs in a, that was almost bad. It runs in a, a process and does message passing. And sometimes it takes a while because this actually is using some of the security complexities, these locks, and uh, it should have received. So that's our node. It's now part of the network. So if we get nodes, we'll see that. And then um, there's the next API is get node. And the ID is seven. It returns, so get node returns okay. It's a tuple with an okay in the node. So I'm gonna kind of not deal with that right now and just use this. And then, so we're gonna connect to the node and establish a connection between um, our controller and this node. And a bunch of output. So interesting thing about IX, V, well, is the value of the last thing that was printed, so I'm just doing that, and then let's do something. So this next function is the main function um, that we'll concern ourselves with. And we're gonna pass the, the node, the lock, the device there, and then we pass it a command. So we're gonna get the state of the lock here. So it's unsecure, which is actually false. So sometimes this happens in hardware. Let's, uh, let's set, let, it'll fix itself. Let's set, um, so we can set the state. Um, thank you. Uh, let's make it unsecured. Let's see if that, it unlocked, so. That's like the main point, of, that's like the main API that you would work with if you're building your own smart home. And I have stickers, and, ask, and let me know if you have any questions. Uh, my name is Zach Daniel, I work at Dockyard. Uh, I've never given a talk before, so I decided to start with a five minute talk. Um, and I'm mostly up here because I couldn't deal with being the only Dockyarder that didn't talk today. Uh, <laughs> so one thing I see often, uh, whenever I get to work with a new client or work at a new job, uh, is there's a lot of little things that you can do to uh, help yourself with your Postgres database. Uh, just super actionable, quick, easy tips uh, you could take back and just you know, improve your effectiveness. So uh, let's just uh, roll into them. So for deployment, uh, some of these are obvious. Deploy in the same network, uh, you're gonna you're gonna incur like a significant amount of latency if you're de deploying your Postgres database to a different network. Um, use the latest stable version. A lot of times I hear, you know, I, we'll, we'll see somebody on Postgres 9 or Postgres 8. Uh, it's relatively painless to upgrade and uh, they're mostly stable. There was actually a bug in like the most recent stable version, so maybe I shouldn't give you that advice, I don't know. Uh, but tune your database uh, very often. 
uh, people will just be running with the vanilla Postgres database that they got by a you know yum install or whatever, uh, and they don't realize that there's a lot of you know a lot of tuning variables that you can set that are going to make your database perform better with your hardware, um, especially if you're on SSDs. Uh, Postgres doesn't come tuned for SSDs by default, so you know you're going to see a lot of gains if you just go to pgtune.leopard and it's going to give you like some really basic. Uh, useful defaults to use for tuning your database. Uh, these aren't all of them, and I don't have time to explain all of them, uh, but uh, Postgres also has a guide on it, all its uh, tuning variables. So for migrations, uh, avoid using application code. Uh, that, that, that's predominantly because you're not going to notice when you delete application code that breaks a migration, because you've probably already run that migration locally. Um, Two-phase migrations, that's probably one of the bigger tips uh, that a lot of people, I, I noticed, they don't follow um, and is extremely useful, um, which I'll illustrate here in a second. Uh, and also know what operations are locking or expensive. Um, this one's pretty obvious. Don't use application code in your migrations, at least as best as you can, because somebody's going to delete that, right? I've seen that all the time, uh, and it just kind of wastes time, and sometimes you don't notice until you've either shipped it to, until you've shipped it and somebody's downloaded your library or whatever. Uh, and can't use it anymore. Um, Two-phase migrations. Don't do this, right? Especially if you're running an important production application. Don't remove a field. Don't add a field to your schema and create the field in the database in the same deployment. Um, this is uh, predominantly to avoid having that little blip in between when you run your migrations and when your application is actually successfully de deployed. Um, where your application is using a field that doesn't exist, right? Ecto schemas, all queries against them will fail uh, if they are referencing a field that doesn't exist in the database. Uh, it's very inconvenient. Um, and it also doesn't let you roll back. If you write your code like this, you actually can't roll back. Everybody thinks they're secure, like, oh, I can just roll back. But then you realize you have to roll everything back, um, and you can't do them at exactly the same time. So you're always going to have these little blips of downtime. So instead, first, remove the field from your schema and add this new field that you're adding. This is an example of you know, replacing some field with a new field. Um, and uh, then it, ship that. Ship it to production. And then the next time you ship to production, you can do the rest. And this means that any two versions of your application are compatible with the migrations from the last one. right? So you can always freely go back and forth. You can do your migrations whenever you want. You could do it after you deploy. right? Uh, there's a lot of benefits to doing things like that. Um, locking and expensive operations. Um, I see this all the time. Uh, people will just you know, add a default value to a column that you're adding to a table and not realize that's going to A, take forever, and B, lock the table. Right? So don't do it. Uh, creating indexes, indices, indexes. I'm not sure which one that is supposed to be. But uh, again, that's going to lock the table for updates. Right? So if, you're, if you create an index on a large user's table, all of a sudden you know, people can't sign up or alter their account. So look out for stuff like that. Uh, for querying, uh, explain and analyze are your friends. Um, it's not really a mystery why your query isn't doing well. Uh, there are tools to help you with that. Uh, Denormalize your data. It's very important. Uh, it's really easy. And so sometimes it feels dirty, but it's a very useful thing. Uh, and there's a lot of SQL out there, a lot of little useful tricks that aren't in your sort of standard repertoire. Um, this is a Postgres explain visualizer. Uh, it's very easy to use. Just put in your explain results, and it's going to tell you exactly what about your query was difficult. And if you don't know what a seek scan is, you can Google it. It'll be all right. Um, denormalization. Yeah, it's weird to have like a count of posts on your user, but you use that kind of stuff all the time, and it's going to make your interactions with your database a lot more performant than grouping up your posts table and getting a count every time you need it. Um, yeah, oh, the SQL you'll find if you just look through stuffy documentation for hours. Um, it's really not that bad, but uh, there's tricks like grouping sets that also can be phrased as a roll-up um, that's going to get you a lot of information that you might have made uh, a lot of queries for. Uh, it's going to get you that in one query. Um, or for instance, the filter statement, which is relatively new, uh, but it lets you get a lot of count results in one go. And monitoring, use PG Hero. It's very easy to use. It's very fun. And I had to skip that part, but thank you. That was my talk. All right, so I'm going to do a, a talk that was prepared for a 45 minute slot in Elixir Brazil, the conference, and I translated it, and I'm going to do it in five minutes. So, a lot of slides. Anyway, 
it's about sets. Why use sets? For instance, let's say you have an application like this script that I did in Elixir that allows you to search for Unicode characters by name. So for instance, RF is the name of the application, is the rune finder. If I, I say cat, uh, face cat, it lists all the Unicode characters that have face and cat. If I add, for instance, face cat eyes, now I only get three cats that also have the eyes word in it. And how is this done? There's a, a, a file called unicodata.txt that you can download from unicode.org. And you can uh, basically, what this application, what this script does, scans the file and selects the, the lines that have all the words in the query, OK? Now, if you don't have sets in your language, like the, the guys in, the, in Goland, they don't have sets. So you have to write code like this, you know? It's a f two nested for loops with ifs, flags, true, false, pretty, pretty uh, high uh, cyclomatic complexity, even for a, a small bit of code like that. So you don't want to write that. You can actually you know, make it a little bit better by splitting it into functions, but that's not good enough uh, anyway, uh, also. So then this guy comes and says, uh, what if not now I'm busy coding nested conditionals and loops? What this guy is seeing is this is actually a set operation, OK? And uh, this means the query is a subset of the description. If that's true, then it's a match. OK? Uh, and you have, uh, we have in, in, Ru in, in, in Elixir excellent uh, set. Uh, we have map set with a rich API. So I, I can just use, see, if on line 13 there, if map set subset query words, et cetera. So we have subset operation. Another example, I like to play with Unicode. So I did this other version. And this one is intended to be deployed as a web application, but I also have a, a, a command line interface here. The difference between this version is that it, it, it builds, it works pretty much the same, but internally it builds a, a, an inverted index. And what is an inverted index? It's an index where there is a mapping of words and the idea of the places where they occur. In this case, Unicode uh, codes, right? And then if you do, if, I, if I, I, I query the index of face, you get a bunch of numbers, the index of cat, a bunch of numbers, the index of eyes, and a bunch of numbers. But then I can build map sets out of those. Actually, those are map sets that I'm, that I'm returning. And if I uh, do the, the intersection of all of them, basically this is the operation that we are doing, and we find the, the, the cats that we wanted. Now, uh, another example. In this case, the code you shows the inverted index here is the, the, the structure that uh, has the mapping of words to sets of characters. And then here is the intersection of all uh, the, the things. Anyway, another example. Mark all products pre previously favorited except those already in the shopping cart. So this is set difference. The point is, logic and sets have a, a deep relationship. Uh, and Elixir uh, sets are pretty good. We have a rich set, uh, set API compared to some other languages. Uh, those four at the top have good uh, set APIs. Those have, have kind of poor APIs, and Go has no uh, set at all. So map set in the, in the uh, Elixir library is very complete. And I wanted to play with the idea of implementing an, a set in another way, but f following that interface. So I copied an example, the idea from this book, the Go Programming Language. The, the book is actually very, very good. And the only difference is that the elements of the, my set type must all be integers. And instead of size, we have length because of the, the, the naming rule about size versus length, right? OK, and the interesting thing is when you implement sets as a bit vector on a large int, the set operations become bitwise operations. So anyway, I won't be able to show you this. This is the internal representation. But what I'm showing here is, see this last one? I have a set built with the numbers 0, 150, and 100. And basically, that's an integer with 100 bits 
where the one at the 100 position is the mean, means that the, the number 100 is there. And I have the implementation. You can go check it out. I won't be able to explain it now because we don't have time. And it's really interesting. And I, I recommend that you use more sets in your daily work because you're going to save a lot of work. And that's what I wanted to say. And I want to say thank you very much and add another cat emoji. Thank you. My name is Isaac Yadamoto. I am going to start a new job uh, at a place that is using Elixir to deploy uh, deep learning VMs. So if you're interested in purchasing that sort of thing or working on those sorts of things, come find me. Um, my contact information is liable to change like crazy in the next few days. Uh, the um, stuff I'm talking about, you can find on um, GitHub at itunimo slash state server. Um, and I've also contributed a, uh, something on HexPM called XDHCP, which is a pretty cool DHCP, um, DHCP uh, uh, library. OK, so um, this is going to be a live code demo. So let's hope this works. And I need to find my mouse first. OK, let's move that over. And I'm going to try and do this from memory. Maybe you guys could help me. Um, so in the last place that I worked at, uh, I had one of my juniors do all the things where they learned um, you know, how to use gen servers and all that. And then I was like, OK, we need to write a state machine for this one thing. Uh, have you guys ever used gen state machine or gen state M in Erlang? Oh, the Erlang guy's gone. OK, good. Because, have you tried using it? Are you, and like gen state machine isn't that helpful because it says it punts and it says go go look at the documentation at Erlang gen state M. and it, the formatting actually matters because it's really hard to tell what the types are and all that sort of stuff. It's 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 hard to use and as a result, my junior programmer made a ton of mistakes. Um, it was a learning experience for both me and him. And so in the time since I've left the previous company I worked at, I've been working on this for about like five days now. Um, so if you had to do it, would you be able to? You, you said you've seen uh, gen, gen state M before. If you had to do it, would you be able to write a state machine in a, with a gen server without, like, w from memory? Like, just a simple light flip. No, in gen server. Yeah, right. But in, for gen state M, it would be really tricky, right? OK, so let's try doing this. OK, so one thing about, about state, um, uh, state server uh, is that it does re enforce one requirement, which is that you have to define the state graph. So for a, for a switch, it might look something like this, right? Uh, and off, when you take the flip transition, transition goes to on. And then um, you just do what you would normally do. So uh, def handle call. Um, let's do a flip call. Um, and then what we will take is calls require from. And then, um, and then we, let's say we don't care what the state is and we don't care what the data is. Oh, actually, no, let's report it. Oh, thank you. Uh-oh. Am I going to be in trouble here? Uh, OK, so maybe I, should, maybe I should type this out. Uh, where was I? Oh, sorry, my mouse. All right. Um, I was hoping to be able to use, use uh, OK, here we go. All right, let's just do it here. Um, Oh, OK. State server, state graph. Flip. And uh, now my computer is dead. <laughs> Flip. Oh. 
Okay. Um, anyways, check this out. Uh, basically, what it does is it fans out all of your all of your uh, uh, events, event handling into things that you're familiar with, ha like handle call. Um, you can do um, reply and no reply like you would expect with a gen server, and it just basically makes the process of interacting with um, Erlang's built-in um, state machines much more ergonomical. So um, sorry I couldn't show you the demo, um, but uh, yeah, problem. have fun with it. My name is uh, Phil Tolan, and uh, I work for a startup called Hipware. We're working on a, on a mobile application called Tiny Robot. Uh, it is um, intended to help you connect with your friends and family IRL, but while respecting your privacy at the same time, which uh, many location-based apps today don't. It's available in the Google Play Store and the Apple App Store, go check that out. The back end is written entirely in Elixir, and we've pulled out a couple of really useful pieces of functionality, and I wanna talk briefly about those. The first is called Dottle, and it's basically just an event handling framework. Right now it's connected up to SQS, um, but the back end is abstracted through a behavior. You could hook it up to RabbitMQ, we're actually looking at options for local delivery if you uh, are concerned about latency or don't need the guarantees that you get from SQS or something like that. Um, and it's really simple. So you uh, define a module uh, and a struct that is your event. And you can put whatever you want in there. I don't recommend putting uh, an ecto uh, object with tons of preloads or anything like that because they're is a size uh, restriction on messages in SQS. But otherwise, go nuts. Put whatever you want in there. Uh, then you define a handler. So you do that by using dottle.handler, and you can do, uh, you can use only to say, I only want to handle these events. You can use accept to say, I don't want to handle these events. I want to handle everything else. And then you just define a function, handle event. And of course, you can pattern match on the event structure there and uh, then do whatever you need to do. And somewhere else in your code, you create an, uh, you create an instance here of, of your event structure and call dottle.signal, and that's all there is to it. Super simple. That is fairly useful and we use it quite a bit, but we got to thinking, what if we used it to catch Postgres notifications and allow you to handle those in your app code without going through all of the normal hoops you have to jump through if you want to use Postgres notifications. So we've been using this for a couple of years now in our application, and it's pretty cool. So the first thing you need to do is uh, create an Ecto migration, um, import dottledb.migration. We'll give you these uh, utility functions, create watcher events table, creates the state that we need to track these events within Postgres, and then the update notify will create the uh, triggers necessary in the database to fire the notifications. Once you've done that, then you can define a uh, handler, use .ldb.handler, type, the type argument there is your ecto schema, and then you just have handle insert, handle update, and handle delete, and if, when you insert a new record into that user table, your handle insert gets fired with the new record. You can do whatever you want with it. Handle update includes both the new and the old record, and handle delete handles the old record. Uh, and that's really all there is to it. It's super smooth. It works pretty well. We've been using it for a while. Um, all of these are available in hex right now. They're basically beta status. I don't uh, see the um, API changing, but we are sort of refining the back-end implementation of both. Please go check it out. Let us know what you think. If you find it useful, uh, we'd really appreciate hearing that. Thanks. I'm Eric, and this is, uh, I just want to show off a project I have called Grapevine. Um, so this is a MUD community site. So MUDs are, are really old uh, games that were played in the 80s and 90s and are still hanging around. Um, 
So this is a, a site that you can go and kind of find new games. Uh, it's also a cross-game chat network. Um, you can see the games that are connected here. So we have a bunch of, of kind of test uh, development games, and then there's this uh, Syndome that has a whole bunch of players. Uh, it's pretty much our only real game um, right now. Um, we can you know, take a look at there's a web client. So this is a test server I have called Spigot. Uh, so we can go ahead and play, and this is a web client. It's actually talking through secure telnet, which is kind of a, a weird thing to say, but uh, it is what it is. Uh, so this is uh, what actually also just happened is um, OAuth through telnet. So there's a, the, the first part of the handshake. Um, we didn't see it because I've already authorized it, um, but there was a, a, the server says, hey, I want to do OAuth. The client says, okay, go ahead. It sends the first message over, and then after that, it's through the standard telnet or standard OAuth. Um, we can see the gauges kind of flow through. Uh, this is through a telnet spec called GMCP, uh, so it's it's getting caught as an event and being pushed forward through the browser. Um, we saw uh, ANSI escape codes earlier. This is a Java. This uses a JavaScript uh, parser library for the other side of that. Um, we go ahead and quit. Um, so yeah, I just kind of wanted to show show it off. There's a web chat. Um, this is actually the the real live thing, so I'm going to get off it in case someone says something that we don't want to see. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to show that it's, it exists. It's on GitHub. It's all open source. Uh, it's a it's a clustered application. If you want to kind of see that in a real real application, um, see how that works. Here's the test server that I just showed. Um, there's also a project I have called XVenture, which is the other side of that. So this is a full uh, test game. So you can go see MidMud is an instance of this. Um, MidMud is also connected to Grapevine. So this is, comes with a web client. You can also talk by a telnet. Um, yeah, so it's just a, it's a MUD. You can run around through clicking and whatnot. Um, so yes, this is all also open source. And then lastly, I, I help run a convention called RestFest. Um, it's in South Carolina uh, in, in, this, in September next month. If you're interested in, in web APIs, this is a small unconference. Uh, come and hang out with us and chat about APIs. Um, so yeah, that's all I have. Some things with nerves are very productive, and some things are not so much, and sometimes it takes a frustrating long time to get started. So I wanted to show something we're experimenting with to see if this might help this, the getting started situation. So here's the, uh, I think this is the kind of the standard way a lot of people come to nerves. They get some idea, hey, nerves is cool, let's try it out. All right, buy a Raspberry Pi, buy some batteries, hardware, put it in something. Well, that's the idea. And then they go to the docs. Here's some of the docs. Um, they install Mac, you do some stuff. Um, then you do some more stuff for Erlang and Elixir. Maybe you look at the examples. Um, after you look at a few examples, you find out about this thing called Nick Gadget, which makes a lot of basics easier. So you get there, and then, well, then you're kind of tired, and then you kind of put off your work for the next day. So this is not good. So the, what the, we're trying to do with this thing called the Quick Start Firmware, so the idea is, is that we make these firmware bundles, we can post them on the, um, the internet, people can download them to micro SD cards. All of you could make them too if you want to have something easy to try out for people. Um, so I'm going to show two quick ones. Um, this one's called, for our project called Elixir Circuits. So the Elixir Circuits Quick Start Firmware you can find over here on this, um, on, well, you can almost see the URL, but the idea is with the Elixir, Elixir circuits is to interface with various hardware devices. It's kind of like underneath uh, some of the other things that people have demoed here. So you go here, you go to the releases page, um, find like if you have a Raspberry Pi, you pick you know your Raspberry Pi like RPI three. If you have a BeagleBone, that's BBB or Pocket Beagle. There are a whole bunch. Um, you pick one of those files, um, download it. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with Etcher I.O. Um, for other work that they've done, so you can load it up into there, program a micro SD card. For those of you who use Nerves a bunch, you can also use FWUP. Um, so for the Elixir Circuits ones, you put them in the SD card, plug it in your Pi, boots to IEX, and then you can play with the hardware. So 
once you get that in, there's like this long, we have this LED example that you can kind of work through to try things out. You can, if you have Raspberry Pi, put hats on, try out things with I2C, SPI, UART, GPIO. They're all, they're little tutorials over the internet and you can just plug this in and do a quick experiment. So the other example that I wanted to show was this thing called the Nerves Key. This is a crypto chip that we use on IoT devices to hide the, pro the private key. It keeps the private key secure for like when you connect to um, AWS IoT, it's that little black chip in the corner. So the problem with these things are they're one time programmable and they have all this jargon associated with it and kind of the combination of those two makes you um, not want to program at the first couple times because every time you do, you have to start over. That's uh, getting a new, a new part. So we have, uh, um, so Justin Schneck, he, he helped build this uh, Phoenix Live View app that's bundled into a piece of firmware. You can get it um, on GitHub and on that repo, and you get a screen like this. So you plug it in the Pi, boot it up, um, point uh, your, your web browser to nerfsky.local so the Raspberry Pi is on the Ethernet, so you can just get to this. And I think a lot of this stuff probably won't mean much to most people, but this is, um, really helpful when you're following directions for how to program the thing, especially the first time. All right, so um, the quick starts builds, this is kind of neat. Um, everything's automated, so when I commit to something to these, circles, we're using Circle CI, but there's nothing particular to that. It automatically builds the firmware images, and um, the tagged ones get posted to the GitHub releases. Um, so anyway, getting back to that, if you're interested in doing this with one of your projects, or you have something that you like people to um, start out quick. I think that these couple projects uh, have some code that are good starter examples. Uh, let's see, future um, Wi-Fi configuration is popular. We're going to add that into the quick starts. Um, discoverability is a really nice thing when you have these, you know, be able to plug these uh, micro SD cards and hardware, put them somewhere and be productive quickly. Um, and then the, the other thing is Nerves Hub gives us a firmware update dis um, network, so it'd be really cool to plug some of this stuff in there. And that's it. Here are the links, and thanks. My talk is uh, not too technical. Um, so, other benefits of crying in tech. So, a tale of boot camps and tears. That's one of my favorite giffies. So, how did I choose my topic? I went to a boot camp, very, very hard one. It's called Turing, seven months long, 80 hours a week. And my first week there, I noticed a trend. Everybody cries. Like, it's an emotional roller coaster. Like, I've seen people just kind of go nuts. And I realized, like, all right, um, why is this happening? Is there a benefit here? Um, there's a lot of, like, high-performing people here, and they're crying, but there's got to be some sort of, like, benefit. So I asked myself, is there any benefit? So first I took off to YouTube, and I just did a couple searches. There really wasn't anything, like, t there that had too much substance. Um, in terms of like actual data. So I went to one of my other favorite sites. I don't know if you guys ever use Sci-Hub. Um, it's a website with over 69 million scientific uh, or academic papers, and it bypasses publisher walls so you could essentially get all these research papers for free. And on average, um, a research paper costs between 20 and 30 bucks a pop, and sometimes they're really bad, and it's not the one that you want. So it's a good way to check them out. So once I hopped on Sci-Hub, I looked up crying, and what I discovered was, apparently, according to the research, only humans cry with tears in response to emotional events. Uh, the majority of research on crying has been done in just the last 20 years. It involves so many different aspects of like, the human body, we don't know exactly uh, how most of it works. Um, but most of the actual research has been done on the tears themselves. We have three types of tears. We have reflex tears, continuous tears, emotional tears, and most of them, most of your tears are water, but if they're emotional tears, there's a stress hormone which actually gets released, which actually like, you know, lowers your stress. It's like your body actually pushing the badness out of you. Um, like, like Pikachu, for example. But fun fact, tears contain lysozyme, which breaks down the cell walls of bacteria and pathogens, which means your tears are like Lysol. So feel free to cry over your laptops because not only will you feel better, uh, but your laptop will be a lot cleaner. Um, so long story short, boot camps and work can be stressful, very challenging, and sometimes you wanna cry. You should, crying is good for you. 
Um, and I'll leave you with one of my favorite uh, quotes. What need is there to weep over parts of life? The whole of it caused for tears. So if you ever want to talk uh, stoicism, let me know. It's one of my favorites. And if you ever want to talk to me or looking for elixir dubs, that's me. And that's it. <laughs> um, how many of you have used GraphQL before? Awesome, there's a couple of you. Uh, so I absolutely love GraphQL. I won't have too much time to explain it, but I want to talk about what I've been doing with GraphQL over the past couple days, and hopefully some of you find it a little bit interesting. So first off, who am I? I'm a software engineer at Tinfoil Security. I basically write dynamic analysis tools. Uh, what that means is I'm doing runtime analysis of web applications to look for security vulnerabilities. Uh, primarily, up till now, that's been in REST APIs and in uh, more standard single page apps. But I'm hoping to start doing this for GraphQL app, or, uh, APIs in the near future. And uh, we've been doing this with Elixir for about four years now. So first off, what is dynamic analysis? Uh, it's looking uh, at an application's runtime to look for errors, whether that's bugs, vulnerabilities, denial, service vectors, that sort of thing. It's black box. We don't have access to source code. So it's just based on what behavior we can observe. For web applications, this is pretty straightforward. You start by crawling the app. You find all the input vectors. That's things like forms, links, local storage, uh, cookies, just any way that a user can feed input into the app. And uh, then you basically trace those inputs to see where they flow. Those are called the data sinks. And then what our goals are is to basically fuzz all of those uh, user input sources to look for ways that we can exploit behavior in the application. So that could manifest itself as SQL injection or cross-site scripting or things like that. Basically, you're looking for ways where untrusted user input doesn't properly get sanitized or uh, go through input validation and so on, and eventually ends up somewhere dangerous. So what does this mean for APIs? First off, uh, APIs are traditionally fairly difficult to perform uh, dynamic analysis on because they are not very discoverable. If you're dealing with a REST API, for example, you can't just open it in your browser and crawl it. Uh, so traditional techniques don't really work. Uh, GraphQL is really cool, though, because uh, it lets you intercept the schema. Basically, you can send a query to the API, and it'll return all the types, all the unions, interfaces, uh, the edges between them, the types of all the fields, that sort of thing. And so I'm able to use that to build a schema just from the URL of an endpoint. And then from there, my next goal is to basically get a set of representative queries that will try to cover all the API's functionality. And then if I just pass those to my fuzzing engine, I can basically start looking for vulnerabilities in the GraphQL API for free. So what do I mean by representative queries? Uh, basically, first off, there are going to be a set of queries that cover all the functionality in the API. So we visit every field, and we hit every argument that the API can accept. Uh, you'll notice we're visiting every field, not every type. The reason for this is that in GraphQL, uh, resolvers run on fields themselves. So there may be more than one way to reach a given type that may have different authorization logic and so on uh, on it. So we care about the fields, not the types. And our goal is to minimize the number of queries we make. We don't want to uh, just spam an API by sending a million requests at it when we can make do with 10,000. And we want the queries to be as simple as possible. We really want to be focusing on one slice of the API with every uh, audit that we're performing. And uh, that also means that we obviously want to avoid cycles because they're not telling us anything new about the API. So for examples of what I mean, on the right there, I just have a really basic graph of an example schema. Uh, maybe it's for a forum. There's threads, users, and posts. You can get from the root to threads or users. And then from there, you can either get to posts or back to users and threads. Uh, a bad query would be the one on the side there, where we go threads, posts, users, threads, posts, users, uh, ad infinitum. That would uh, not tell us anything new about the API, so we want to filter things like that out. Another example would be like that top query we have there. Uh, that's actually equivalent to just going to users directly and then to threads from there. So we want to filter things like this out and try to find the simplest uh, queries that cover the entire API's functionality. So. In this case, uh, the representative set would be those two queries there. We want to go from threads to users, posts, users, and from users to threads, posts, threads. I'm going through this really quickly, sorry. Uh, but basically, given those two queries, we're hitting all of the query logic on the API. Uh, and from there, we're good. So I have a mostly untested algorithm that I've implemented for doing this. And basically, I first do the introspection uh, query, get the schema. Then I compute the line graph of that graph, which, if you're not sure what that means, basically, I turn all the 
uh, vertices into edges and all the edges into vertices. Uh, that basically lets me operate on the fields rather than the objects because I uh, care about traversing, or I care about visiting all the edges more so than I care about visiting all the nodes. Then I give each edge a weight equal to the distance from the root, and then the minimum spanning tree uh, will basically just give me all the queries that I care about. So let's see a demo of this. Hopefully this works. I just built this in like the past two days. So I have a Draft API I found online. It just serves up all the Pokemon. Oh no. Uh, I can grab that. I can dump the schema. I can look at an abstract query I generated from that schema. I can convert that to GQL. And then, oh no. I'm so bad at using trackpad, sorry. Yeah. So if I just paste this into a, graphical workspace. You notice it's parameterized with all the arguments that those queries take. Just, just pass in an argument. Oops. And bam, we just queried a whole bunch of Pokemon from an API that we knew nothing about except the URL for. And if I just pass this stuff to my fuzzing engine, now we can find vulnerabilities. Cool. Uh, that's all I had to talk about. We're hiring. Hit me up if any of this sounds interesting to you. Today I'm going to talk about testing multi-node Phoenix with XUnit. Uh, like other people, this was kind of a longer form talk, but I've chopped this down, so we're going to go real fast. I'm Torin. This is what I look like on the internet. When I'm not programming, you find me either fishing or collecting vintage EmberJS t-shirts. I guess that's a hobby. I work at Legends, uh, elementary and middle school, ed tech startup. We do uh, math and science. If you're interested in video games, Elixir, check us out. So we're going to set up the problem here before we get into the testing story. When I was first getting into Elixir, I had this fun idea that uh, ETS would replace Redis or whatever cache, and I would never need to go to the database. So on boot, I'd have my singleton gen server get all the data, shove that into ETS, and then every subsequent request, I would just interact with ETS. Really bad idea, by the way. Don't do this. But it made for a really great demo and uh, got me into a distributed systems problem. So imagine we have this setup where we have two nodes, and someone gets into node number one and adds some new information. When somebody comes along and requests that new information from node number two, and it's not there, this is our distributed systems problem. So I wanted to talk, instead of necessarily solving this problem, just how did I go about testing it? When I was first verifying it, I was actually spinning up Docker. And every time I made a change, I would actually have to do a Docker compose build, Docker compose up, manually click through. It was kind of painful. I wanted something, a tighter feedback loop, something you get in XUnit. And so this brought me closer to local cluster. And this is kind of right out of the README. It's local cluster .start nodes. Give it a number of nodes that you want to start up. And then effectively, you have two different isolated pieces of software running at the same time. But you can play with those in XUnit. Funny story. First time I ran this, it didn't work. Turns out you need to know about distribution. I knew nothing about it. This is back in like February. I was just getting into Elixir, and all I saw was this. And I was like, what the heck is a match error, right? So no idea what this was, but it turns out if you come up from a cold boot and you haven't had distribution started, you need to run epmd-daemon, and then you'll have distribution. Let's jump into the test code. Now that I had distribution working, I wanted to actually spin up and hit both of these nodes. I was copying this test code really from a training I did back in February at Lone Star with Chris and Ben. And I started looking at this example they had where I was like, oh, I'm going to have different ports and probably a different host. So I need to actually get these different dynamic hosts configured. How do I do that in Phoenix? So what I found was it was pretty simple. Go to the endpoint. When you init, you can actually just grab that environment variable and set the port. So let's jump back to the test. Now we have ports working. I've got my con case set up. I'm doing my post. And I find some interesting behavior. As I get deeper into it, I know I've set the port, but what about the host? And so I start doing some IO inspect, and I find that in my controller, there's this manager at localhost. I have no idea what this is. So I go back to my test. I IO inspect node one and node two, the two test uh, nodes I spun up. And they were example one and example two. So something was obviously broken. Long story short, I threw out the concase test, spun up HTTP poison. I started using get and post with poison. Let's get into those tests. 
So I'm just doing get and post, hitting the URL directly with the port 4001 or 4002, and I hit another error. Econ refused. Turns out you need an actual server running. I'm not using the con case test helpers anymore, so I had two choices. Either go in and set a flag, all my tests suddenly are now using a real server. I didn't want to do that, because a lot of the tests don't do this. So I instead opted to just write a method that lets me flip the bit, stop and start it, so I could still test distribution just in a one-off case. Now, this isn't the whole story. I've written this whole thing up in depth on my blog and actually solved it. Source code's all available. First thing you find out in this blog is the whole PG2 story. So you see PubSub pub sub end to end solves this bug that I showed you at the beginning. Second, I actually go even deeper into how do we test drive net splits with Schism. Schism's a library Chris Keithley wrote, lets you sort of partition the network, verify some behavior, and then heal the network. I test drive all that in this blog post. And then finally, if you want to see the full Redis implementation for the multi-node connectivity, like node A, how do they talk to node B, how do they get on the same page, that's all included, and it's at bit.ly slash multi-node. And if you don't like the HTTP, you can just check out my blog. I also want to give a shout out to Legends. My boss actually flew me out here and love working there. Awesome to work on video games. If you're interested in any of that, check me out. I'm actually not going to talk about Elixir. I'm actually going to talk about JavaScript and really talking about archaeology and the history of the web uh, in 20 years with GeoCities. So it all started with one torrent. I downloaded this torrent. It was one terabyte. It was the GeoCities dump. And this was taken in 2009 um, by archive team. They do a bunch of stuff for archiving the internet. Um, and I really wanted to make like a machine learning model to like generate GeoCities websites. It's not this talk. Um, this is really just analyzing the GeoCities talk, or the GeoCities uh, dump. And so the dump was 641 gigabytes, um, which is kind of surprising nowadays. Uh, you can walk around now with like one terabyte in your pocket now. So you could all be walking around with the whole GeoCities dump in your, in your pocket. Um, yeah, so 600 gig gigabytes compressed for GeoCities. Um, and it's in the 2000s, which is coming up to 20 years ago. And processing the dump, we can skip this. Uh, this is what the dump looks like. There's a few folders in here. Um, there's a couple things. Do not do this. Um, there's some bash commands. Here's me extracting this. And I just wrote a quick Rust binary to analyze the HTML, parse out the AST, um, which uses the servo project stuff. Um, and so while that's extracting and running and doing all the calculation stuff, uh, quick side story, I found this JavaScript file. Um, it was written in 2001, and it's named animate.js. And there's some interesting stuff. It looks like normal JavaScript written, I think, 19 years ago. And there's global variables, but there's an interesting check down there that's a browser-based check for IE4, it looks like. And IE4 was released in 1997. And that got me interested in like what this file really is. And there's an interesting line, which is CKB article about changing this dynamic HTML. And Charles asks, like, what is AnimeJS? I have not found any documentation on what this is. And someone actually answered this. Um, as far as I can tell, MS front page includes a file called AnimeJS. Is this the file you're looking for? And so I went to my local library and found this book, Front Page 2002 for Windows, and there actually is AnimeJS in there, uh, written in 2001. So this is our file. And so this was actually the first, I think the first animation JavaScript library, um, which was provided in Microsoft Front Page. They called it dynamic HTML, which was like modifying HTML and adding special effects. It was kind of their way of doing JavaScript. Um, they called it DHTML. And for context, that happened in 2001, and jQuery came out in 2006. So we didn't really have any libraries back then. So I think this was the first library that ever existed. Um, XML HTTP requests um, came out in 2002. Um, but back to indexing stuff. So I indexed 3.9 million documents. And here's some small stats on like what type of DOM elements were used at that time. And while I was indexing this, actually, thanks Lance, who said um, there was something about 22 font tags per document, HTML document, which I thought was very excessive. Um, but Lance confirmed it's totally fine. 
So let's open up the CSV. So the top count for is BR tags at 1.2 billion. Uh, A tags, um, these are just regular elements that you'd expect, but you'd probably be thinking like, where's my blink, where's my marquee? They're actually all the way down here. Uh, down here at 46,000 and 45,000. So they're actually not as popular as other ones. Um, there's actually Java applets which are used more than Blink and Marquee tags. Um, but there's some interesting ones, frames, if you remember using frames, and uh, I guess there's a bunch of weird stuff in here. I don't know what's going on. There's map. If you remember image maps, there was a way to overlay links on top of images. So if I had like an image of my kitchen, I can like overlay, overlay a link on top of my refrigerator. So you can click on my refrigerator and navigate to a different page. Um, Java applets was in there and there's a bunch of other stuff. Um, so I think this is work in progress. I just want to start analyzing more, see what I can do with the AST and um, maybe get some cooler stats from it. Cool, thanks.